Hello and welcome to what I consider to be one of the most important shows that we've been doing for several years now and will continue to do so in the future. I must admit, and don't tell Richard this, Richard, how many years has it been? It's been nearly a decade since we've done this show, but obviously we have been doing television for a lot longer. <laughs> right, right. I must admit, and I was saying I don't want Richard to hear this, that I learn more from this regular interaction with Ruchir Sharma than from almost any other program that I've done. I must update you very quickly. Ruchir has now set up his own organization. It's called Breakout Capital, which is already doing brilliantly and has only recently started. So just watch this space. Don't blush now, Ruchir. <laughs> I can see. I must point out, like I do every year, all the research and analysis for this program is done by Ruchir and his fantastic team. And as you know, it really is amazing research. Once again, we shall look at 10 major forecasts for this year, 2023. But let's first spend a few minutes understanding what actually happened last year. And Ruchir, your earlier forecasts for 2022. Shall we go through that? The 10 forecasts that you did yes. last year? Yes, that's usually the routine. <laughs> okay. So let's look at the first forecast that Ruchir made in 2022 last year. Here it is. He said there'll be a decline in the birth rate and that will accelerate. In actual fact, they didn't accelerate. Birth rates stabilized a bit. There was a decline, but they stabilized the rate of decline in the world, flattened a bit, and India is also flattening a bit. Why that change, do you think? No, I think that what happened was that during the pandemic, we right. got a major drop-off in the birth rates uh, of many people. But last year, in 2022, there was a bit of a catch-up in right. terms of that the birth rates have been declining. As you can see from the graph, the birth rates around the world have been declining dramatically, Dramatic, yeah. uh, really, for the last few decades. Yes. Uh, and that pace has been accelerating in the last few years and did so even more during the pandemic. But in 2022, we saw a bit of a bounce back where the birth rates increased in some of the countries, possibly as a catch up to what happened in uh, uh, 2020 and 2021. Right. But the long term trend, I think, still remains still intact, remains dumb, which is that yes. the world is seeing a decline in the birth rates. And so therefore, the population increases around the world have also been slowing down very sharply. And you pointed that related to a smaller workforce and that could affect uh, growth rates yes, of and, the economy. Yes, and that's an, uh, an effect that we are seeing yes, that a, yes. around the world, the growth rates, the potential growth rate of the global economy due to declining uh, birth rates and deteriorating demographics is falling everywhere. So the global economy, which used yeah. to grow at, let's say, three and a half, four percent, now is lucky to grow at two and a half to three percent, right. largely because of the demographic changes. I mean, this, that's an amazing finding, and I don't think many people, I don't think anybody else has really related to the two until you told them about it. Then they just copied you. Let's look at the second forecast uh, that Richard made last year. Uh, he said that China's economic power was peaking. In actual fact, yes, China's economic power has peaked. If you look at the growth rate, uh, look at it compared to the rest of the world. It was 10.3 compared to the rest of the world's 3.8 back in the 2000s. About, what, 7% above global, then it was about 4% above global, and now China and the rest of the world growth rates are about the same. So that rapid development compared to the rest of the world has seemed to have gone uh, recently. Yeah, so that's my point, that we are at that moment now where China, uh, the best economic growth rates are well behind it. It is a middle-income country. It's facing all sorts of challenges. We spoke about demographics at right. the outset of the show. Yes, yes. Uh, very few developing countries have a demographic profile as bad as what China has in, uh, because of its one-child policy having such a lagged impact now. Its debt levels are very high. The property sector is uh, really uh, saddled with Collapsing, too much yeah. Uh, yeah. debt. And so therefore, my forecast is also that in the coming decade, China's growth rate is likely to be closer to 2.5% on average. That's a huge change. Right. I mean, and we from... only saw that in 2022, which is that right. China's growth right. rates fell a lot. Some of it, I think, was suppressed because of its 
uh, zero COVID policy, which has right. been a failure, and now it's re reversing course rather dramatically on that. So China's growth rate may bounce back a bit in 2023, but the long-term forecast based on demographics and debt and productivity is that China's economic growth rate is unlikely to be any faster than right. that of the global economy. So China's share in the global economy may have also peaked. Right. And that is a huge development because right. no country gained as much share in the global economy as China did in the last four decades. It was a dramatic Just rise. Dramatic. I mean, as you showed, growing at 10 percent on average for a few decades is just phenomenal. And that's gone. I'm a bit surprised that it hasn't gone up in base effect because after the pandemic, you think the next year there's a low base. So the growth rate will be higher. But even that hasn't happened. Well, that may happen in 2023. May, just because, with a low base effect. Yeah, because than, yeah. they were the last people to exit the zero COVID strategy. Right. So that suppressed growth made. So it may happen right. in 2023. But right. we're more interested in what the long-term trend growth rate in China is. And I think it's 2.5% a year, which means that it's unlikely to grow faster than the global economy for the foreseeable future. 10% to 2.5%. That is just a phenomenal change. Let's move on to the next forecast that Richard made last year. He said that the global debt trap will deepen. In actual fact, yes, mostly it did. But India was stable. The debt servicing costs, the share of income, if you look at the world, is rising. Debt servicing rising. India, not rising. In fact, falling a little bit, if not stable. That's a big difference between India and the rest of the world. Yeah, this is mainly for the private sector. So I think that in India's case, the private sector has deleveraged. They have reduce the debt burden and so therefore they're in a better shape just now. But around the world, particularly in developed countries, in places like the US, they had taken on so much debt on the private sector side right. um, in terms of the firms that as interest rates have gone up, the cost of servicing the debt has been going up a lot. So therefore, the forecast uh, last year that the debt trap deepens and it seems to have played out that way. Yes, and that is a worry actually because the implications for the future. Moving on to the next forecast that Richard made last year, this was that inflation will rise but may not hit double ditches. That's quite a bold forecast. And actually, yes, it only increased to 8.8. .8. It didn't hit double digits. Of course, it's, it did rise as Richard had forecast and it's kind of back to the levels of the 80s but didn't hit double ditches. Not terrible um, but still worrying. 8.8 yeah, .8 is high. Yeah, because I think a lot of people um, at the beginning of 2022 when we did this show were looking for inflation to rise. Um, some were looking for it to rise explosively. Others yeah. thought it would be transitory. I think we got something in the middle that, yes, inflation did rise. Right. But now it seems to have peaked, which is that across the world, the inflation rates look to have peaked. But as we discuss uh, in the show subsequently, that it's likely to remain much higher than where it was in, let's say, the 1990s or the 2000s. So higher and stickier inflation, but not the 1970s show where inflation was in double digits yes. for a long period of time. Yes, yes, That's, that is a significant difference. The next forecast that Richard made last year was about greenflation. That's about commodities and the commodity prices going up. He had forecast that global commodity prices in 2022 remain relatively high. In fact, commodity prices did remain high. In fact, they went up 15%. That is relatively high compared to other prices. Why is that still happening? Yeah, that's a pretty significant outperformance because remember that most assets like stocks and bonds around the world yes. have fallen uh, significantly in yes, uh, 2022. Yes. The reason that commodity prices have been more resilient um, has been because of oil energy partly driven by what happened in Ukraine, but I think it's much deeper than that, which is that because of concerns about uh, uh, the green uh, environment, you've had a lot of supply cuts that n not much new capacity is coming uh, uh, for right, right, uh, right. commodities because people are very concerned about the impact it has on the environment and lots of regulations and political right. pressure right. is there dissuading people from So in a way, uh, there's a positive up. aspect to that. People are being more careful about how they mine, how they Yes, uh, but the negative effect the is the fact that you're getting higher commodity yes, prices. Yes, so, you know, yes. there's, uh, how do you get from point A to B remains right. a challenge. We yes. all want a greener environment. We right. all want, but the problem is to build a greener, uh, a greener environment, it takes time, A, and two, that it also requires some of the commodities 
to build the new green infrastructure, whether Quite it's right, copper, yeah. aluminium, some of these so-called dirty metals, you need them to build the, the new green infrastructure. To improve the environment. Yeah. So it's a, it's a tough one it's a, ahead. It's a tough one, but supply has been constrained and yes. demand has been weak, but because supply has been so, so constrained, constrained this time that right. even in a global slowdown, commodity prices have been relatively resilient, led by the energy complex. Right. Moving on to the next forecast that Ruchir made last year, and that was that uh, productivity paradox persists. Low productivity. There will be low productivity. Yes, in fact, in actual practice, productivity remain low despite the tech boom. A lot of people said technology is going to change the world and you know, productivity is going to go shooting up. But we just see from that, from his graph, that in 2021, there was a kind of post-pandemic flare-up because of... Uh, you know, in productivity, partly because of the tech boom. But then it's gone back again. There is low productivity now. So the tech boom, Ruchir, has not improved productivity. It's a shocker. Yeah, there are many reasons for this. Um, some of the reasons that I've written about is that it could be that you have so many zombie companies out there, so many inefficient companies being artificially propped or were artificially propped by very low interest rates, too much stimulus. So that's right. been eating away at the right. creative destruction fabric of uh, economies. So the explosion in zombie companies, too much government intervention has been keeping many inefficient companies alive. That could be one uh, reason for this. The other right. reason some people say is that the kind of technology we are seeing, whether it's gaming or other things, uh, are more distracting than enhancing as far as productivity is concerned. So uh, right. I think there are some, uh, this is a very... Uh, deep uh, research topic, which is that why in the midst of this tech boom do productivity numbers continue to look so poor? I think a good reason for that could be the fact that you have too many inefficient zombie companies yeah. uh, which are kept alive. Uh, one statistic, like in the place like the US, the number of inefficient zombie companies, companies that are not able to even service their uh, debt without borrowing more and more, right. uh, that that number has shot up from nearly 2% in the 1980s to nearly 20% now. So 10 times. This, zombie companies have gone up 10 times. Yeah, that's wow. right. In terms wow. of, and that could be chipping away at the creative destruction fabric of uh, any capitalist economy. I know none of our viewers would like to hear this, but has this low productivity got anything to doing, do with working from home? I mean, a lot of, I mean, the pandemic is sort of temporarily over. But people still want to work from home. It depends who you ask, and that's what our next <laughs> okay. show is. Depends on, yeah, what you actually believe. Yeah. The next forecast, he said, did working from home help or hurt productivity? Employees or staff say they are productive at home. Let me stay at home. I'm as productive. 87% say they are productive at home. But their bosses say, sorry, I don't believe you. Only 12% of bosses believe that employees are productive at home. So what's the truth? Exactly. So as I said, it depends who you ask. But it, it clearly is not showing up in the productivity numbers. So maybe the bosses are, are a bit more correct. We don't know, or it's too, a, compl uh, a complicated model. But I find this fascinating about this dichotomy in terms of what the employees believe and what the bosses believe. But I think your productivity won't go down because you've always worked from home, right? <laughs> you don't I wish that to. were the case. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to the next one. Amazing bosses versus the belief of bosses. They live in another world, these bosses. Okay, let's have a look at what uh, Ruchir forecast in 2022, that there'll be increasing data localization. And that actually what happened is data localization in 2022 did intensify. Look at Russia. It's kind of weaponizing data localization. Uh, Maybe you could run us through China is racing to block global dissent. U.S. senators want to stop TikTok. India already did. And this is a bit shocking from your uh, data. India is fifth worst in the world in terms of data restrictions. We just come after China, Saudi, Russia and Indonesia. And then India in terms of data localization. Yeah, this is an index which is maintained by the OECD, which looks at in terms of what has been the digital services uh, enabled businesses, right. uh, what sort of barriers and data restrictions they face. So that's what the OECD ranking is. Uh, so it is what it is. Yes, uh, yes. You know, I think you know, there are about 80 countries in that ranking, uh, about 45 emerging markets in that ranking. Uh, so that's where India's ranking is as per that. I'm hoping that improves uh, if you have a new 
uh, I'm told there's a new draft privacy bill which may help yes, uh, yes. Uh, like improve that. But yeah. as of now, that's the case. And around the world, we've seen that uh, there's been much more uh, of an effort to keep data within uh, countries and not allow for it to uh, really go beyond borders. And that's something which so is... Why is everybody so worried about TikTok? I mean, the U.S. wanting to ban TikTok. Any... Well, I think it's pretty obvious. It's a, it's a Chinese... So, a Chinese and Chinese, it's so popular. Like, so, so popular. And I think that they have a very sophisticated uh, algorithm, AI systems, which I think a lot of people feel sort of uh, breaches kind of the line. Kind snoop into people's yes. uh, private lives, etc. Yeah. Right, right. Next one. This was amazing. Bublets deflate. That means there are a lot of small little parts of the economy that are doing very well. And you said they're going to deflate. Uh, they were doing brilliantly and now look what actually happened. They did fall further. They did deflate. Bitcoins, of course, we all know, gets the most publicity, down 64%. Tech companies with no earnings, some of them are zombies, down 53%. SPACs down 41 Green Energy down 25 Huge change that. Those are big figures. Yeah, in 2021, um, I had identified a few uh, bublets, you know, which yes. are really about uh, good ideas gone too far in a way, which right. is that these were uh, good ideas, mm. but got too much speculative interest in them. And right. so I identified them as bublets. And I'd said that typically if you look at the path, bublets tend to fall by 70% once they peak. Right. Uh, and right. I think that we have roughly seen that yes, payout. Yes, look at uh, that. I mean, it really is. Yeah, this is just for the year. From the yeah. peak, they're down even more because some of them started declining in 2021. Of course, so this is yes. for the last year's data yes, of, yes. of 2022. But this is averaging 50. It would be at least 70%. Yeah, as you had mostly forecast. these yeah. bublets have deflated by 70%. Wow. Uh, so that's sort of played out, yeah. From the peak. From the yeah. peak, wow. yes. And the next, let's have a look at forecast that Richard made in 2022. He said, small investor mania for the stock market will cool down. In fact, in practice, in 2022, the actual, what happened was lower investment by small retail investors happened in India. Look at India's retail flow. That means retail investors, how much they did, did they invest in shares? Dramatic decline in this one year. It, it is quite a serious from 1500 to 500 is like a huge fall. Yeah. Why, are, why is retail investors losing interest? It's partly because we saw such a massive inflow in 2021 that it's yeah. cooling off that. Cooling off. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing, of course, is because interest rates are going up in India. So now right. all of a sudden people think that by putting money in the bank accounts Bonds, or in fixed deposits, yeah. you'll be able to earn some return. Right. So therefore, the very negative interest rates you had in India uh, uh, have changed now. And so therefore, like some of this retail mania has cooled. And again, it's happened around the world uh, that... In the, um, in the U.S., for example, we've seen a massive cooling off of uh, retail media. In fact, there we've seen big outflows uh, with wow. people pulling money out of uh, stocks and bonds because there in the U.S., obviously, the market's down a lot more than in India. So the market's cooled off a bit around the world, uh, including in India, although India's done much better much than the better. U.S. Yes. Uh, but in general, the retail media around the world has cooled. So is there something that the big investors know, the sh retail investors, because big investors are still investing, right, yes. in the market, but the retail, so is there asymmetric information here, yeah, as usual, poor, small investors are getting, don't know something which the big guys know. Well, I'm not sure, but I think that generally they got too caught up in the uh, post-pandemic boom, you know, like in yeah. the euphoria, and I think yeah. that that's sort of cooling off now. Right. Uh, one more forecast, let's have a look at uh, Richard's forecast for 2022 that the physical world is still more important than the virtual world, than metaverse. In fact, what happened in uh, 2022, the physical world investment was actually, as he said, much higher than the new virtual economy. Look at the last 10 years before last year. The investment in new economy was up 5% and in the old economy, down 7%. That's a 12% difference advantage 12% for the new economy. In 2022, the new economy grew by 5.7% and the old economy 9.7% from minus 7 to 9.7. That's a 16% swing. How did you figure this one out? Well, the world had underinvested a lot in the traditional physical economy, whether it's, you spoke about commodities and the underinvestment, you know, due to the green politics. Uh, and then even in uh, machinery, equipment, industrial, they're under investment because everybody was so focused on investing just in tech. So as the tech bubble has burst, 
I think that people have once again gone back to focus on uh, the old economy and how we need much more of that basic infrastructure to still function. And those shortages came through and that's the reason why inflation flared up as well because of the underinvestment in the physical economy. Well, that was the last of the 10 forecasts that Richard made in 2022. And I hate to say this to your face, Richard, and don't blush. You got 90% right. And even the 10, one that you got wrong out of 10, that was pretty close to getting it right as well. It was just a downward trend, but it's still flattening. So I'd give you 97%. Right. Well, the past is no prologue, so <laughs> sure. now we're going to see what happens Now this comes year. the real thing. We move on to... What's going to happen in 2023? What's going to happen in this, this year ahead? And what are Rich's forecasts for that? And remember, 97% right in uh, 2022, last year, and now 100% right. Okay, the first thing, Ruchi, that you're forecasting is there's going to be a long grind. By long grind, you mean there's going to be no bust and no boom. It's not going to be a dramatic recession. You're saying there's shorter recessions now because of easy money, higher government spending and low interest rates. And if you look at the shorter recessions, according to Ruchir, in pre-World uh, War II, the percentage of time that there were recessions was 44%, nearly half the time the economy was in a recession. Then from uh, uh, World War II to 1979, almost 20%, nine, 18% of the time was in recession. That's high. Now... Because of all this easy money era, it's down to half that and one-fourth what it was. This is a huge change. Yeah, I think that this has a lot to do with the role of government stimulus, government intervention, that in the pre-war era, there was very little of government intervention uh, in yes. economies such as the United States or the developed economies of that era. Right. And it's really since then that you've seen much more government intervention and especially in the last three, four decades, as inflation was declining, every, every time there was the slightest trouble, uh, because inflation was low and falling, the governments and central banks were able to come out there and put out a lot of stimulus. And that right. was particularly true in the pandemic, that we saw stimulus like never before during the pandemic. It's amazing data, 44 to 10%. So you're saying John Maynard Keynes was right. Well, in terms of, uh, I'm not sure right or wrong, but <laughs> he clearly had the maximum influence right. on policymakers and generally on economists. And as you were saying, uh, your data shows that in this long grind ahead, government stimulus or rescues increased sharply, leading to shorter and fewer recessions. Look at your data on stimulus as a percentage of GDP. It used to be 1% in 1990. Right. And now it's 46% this time. Amazing change. Yeah, but the only downside of this is yes. the point that we made earlier that mm. because of so much stimulus so much intervention are we keeping too many inefficient companies alive are we not allowing the natural process to play itself out right. where a lot of zombie companies and other dead wood gets cleaned from the system so that's right. the downside but the long grind that i'm forecasting now refers to something a bit different which is that we've been in this era now as i said that as you had declining inflation and you kept getting lower and lower interest rates and uh, the governments were able to stimulate uh, and also cut short recessions. The problem now is that inflation, I think, is likely to remain stickier. Inflation has peaked right. and is coming off in many parts of the world. Yes. But the 2% inflation that we had for much of the uh, developed world right. is likely to be more like 4%. Why? Because the demographics have shifted. The, the people's attitude towards work has shifted. So even now, if you look at it, uh, the global economy has been slowing down and yet unemployment rates around the world are close to record lows. So right, it's very right. hard to get people to come back into the labor force. A lot of people are still living off a lot of the stimulus that was put uh, during the pandemic. In fact, some research shows that nearly half of that excess savings that people built up because of the massive stimulus following the pandemic right. is still sitting in people's banks accounts. Wow. Uh, so, you know, like the whole idea being that that provides a cushion. The problem is this, that so that delays the inevitable, which is that you have so much monetary tightening and yet the global economy has been relatively resilient so far. Right. But the problem is that once those savings run out and then mm. the um, recovery time starts, right. the recovery may also be soft. Much longer. Uh, yes. And the... Uh, 
shape may look like a long smile right. rather of a than kind of a V. Exactly. The normal, the old recessions used to be a sharp down and a quick sharp up. Now you're saying it's going to be a long grind, a kind of a, not a V anymore. Yeah. And that's because inflation is likely to be stickier. And because of stickier inflation, right. uh, the capacity of governments and central banks to stimulate will be much more limited. So therefore, I feel that we are in this period of the long grind. Finally, I uh, just wanted to look at your data on this long grind and what are the implications for India. And they're quite important, very, very serious actually. Because as the world slows, so will India slow down. Because historically, India's growth rate, according to all Ruchir and his team's data, India has been only slightly above the world in terms of growth rate. So if the world slowdowns, India's growth rate is unlikely to be above 5%. Now, historically, India's growth rate has been above the rest. Look at the world on average has been 3.4% growth rate. India has been 6.1%. So India has been 2.7% above the world. And compared to emerging markets, India has been 1.6% higher than the growth rate. Now, explain what happens. If there's this long grind, what are we looking at? Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that we underestimate systematically. This is a debate I've had with so many people in India. We underestimate the global linkages. India's growth rate uh, is very tied to what happens to the rest of the world, at least at the margin. There's a 70% correlation between India's growth rate and the rest of the world's uh, growth rate. And the point is that it is very difficult for the Indian economy, and at least historically so, to grow that much faster than the right. global economy. It's right. quite significant that we have grown nearly three points faster than the global yes. economy, right. but it's impossible to sustain a growth rate much above oh, that is yeah. what we have seen. Even during the boom years of the 2000s, compared to the developed markets and even other emerging markets, India's growth rate uh, was capped beyond a point. So I think that the, if the global economy slows down in 2023 as we forecast uh, to about 2% or so, then India's growth rate is likely to be closer to 5% based on this historical fact pattern. That it really gets capped. I mean, even 3% higher than the rest of the world is pretty high. Yes. But if the rest of the world is slowing, it really slows down India. Yes. And the problem here is that we make our forecasts quite insulated from that. We keep talking about 6%, 7%, 8%. Right. Those growth rates were possible in the 2000s. But at a time when the global economy is going to be growing at 2%, then for us to grow much above 5% right. is going to be nearly impossible until something very dramatic, China-like happens no, out here. That's really fascinating and one has to take this into account in all policy decisions. That is 5% now and how do we tackle that in the economy? Right. Now, the dollar has been rising, rising compared to all other currencies, but you're saying, you're seeing the peak of the dollar. If we look at Rich's data, this is what it looks like. Every time the dollar rises, it's followed by a downturn. Look at those three. And you're now hitting 11 years, which is much longer than peaks that dollar has taken to reach. 11 years is taken. So you're saying we're going to have a downturn now of the dollar, which means rupee was strengthened in comparison or all other currencies. Yeah, I think that, you know, in terms of the, well, the rupee has weakened significantly against the dollar over the last 75 years, as we last spoke yes, about. Yes, uh, But... The rupee's depreciation against the dollar has been particularly sharp over the last couple of years. Yes. And I think that that's likely to slow down because the dollar in general is looking very expensive against major currencies around the world. Now, uh, this is a very important graph in some way that the dollar is the world's reserve currency. Uh, but it, it doesn't always rise. The dollar spends right. time going down. It spends time going up. It right. fluctuates right. against the major currencies. It's fascinating graphic, actually. Yes. Yeah. And I think that the dollar has spent a long time going up over the last decade. But typically, after it rises so much and it feels so expensive, the dollar spends the next few years declining. So I anticipate that the dollar uh, has peaked against most major currencies, such as the euro, such as the yen. Uh, and that in the next few years, it's likely to decline against those currencies. Also, because the U.S. now is running very large deficits, it owes a lot of debt to the rest of the world. And also what happened, I think, last year in 2022 was very significant, that the um, U.S. used the dollar as a weapon to impose sanctions against Russia. 
But what that's done is that many countries around the world, including India, are looking at ways on how do they reduce their reliance on the dollar? How do they right. trade with other currencies and uh, other countries in their own currency rather than trade so much against uh, with the dollar uh, as the invoice currency? So these are changes, structural and, and cyclical very, changes. Very crucial for policymakers here that, okay, you're saying there's a long-term decline of the rupee against the dollar, but it was very sharp decline in the last two years. So while it might continue to be a decline, it won't be as sharp as the last two years. Yes, okay. I think that's the, the finding, dollar. and I th it's backed by the fact that it feels very expensive. So as this yeah. graphic shows, amazing actually that you've looked at the that because of this expensive dollar, the U.S. cities have become the most expensive cities in the world, and the rising dollar you're saying is the major cause. In fact, in the world's 10 most expensive cities, New York, where do you live? <laughs> New York City is the world's most expensive along with Singapore. Then there's Tel Aviv, Hong Kong, and then Los Angeles, that's dollars. Zurich, Geneva, uh, traditionally expensive. San Francisco, again the dollar, and then Paris and Copenhagen and Sydney. So the dollars made cities in America expensive. How yeah. do you manage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, I've been in New York for 20 years. It's never felt that expensive and it's backed by this data. And in fact, I, don't, I can't think in my memory when New York was the most expensive city in the world. And that's what's happened out here. So that tells you further that the dollar has become very overvalued, very expensive and is likely headed for some sort of a correction. Right. This is almost like the, the burger when burgers get too expensive, yeah, the, the burger index, you know, like or even the hotel price rates, right? Uh, they but all the cities is more interesting up. because that's what people experience. Yes, that's right. So nobody should go to New York right now. Right? <laughs> that's what you're saying deep down. Okay, and in this peak dollar forecast, Indian cities are becoming the cheapest in the world. Three out of the top ten cheapest cities or bottom ten cheapest cities are in India the world's least expensive cities. And those are Bangalore, Chennai, Ahmedabad. And then you can see all the rest on that list. And these are rank, world rank 161 uh, down to 172, 172 cities. So everybody should come to India. <laughs> this is a survey done by the Economist Intelligence Unit. They do mm. this, uh, I think, on an annual basis. And yeah, it's a uh, telling sign. These are many yes. indications of where the dollar is. It's a telling sign that some of the most expensive cities in the world are in America. Some of the cheapest cities in the world are in developing economies, which they always are. But the fact that India has three out of those 10 spots is interesting. Amazing, actually. Now, the next forecast is say that America, when America goes down, which it will, the rest of the world will rise. And the data from that is actually also fascinating. This America down, the rest of the world rises. First of all, America down uh, and the rest of the world up because U.S. stock market values are disproportionately high. I, I never realized that. It's got 4% of the population and it's punching well above its weight. It's got 4% of the population and 60% of the market cap. That is just out of whack. And 25% of GDP and still, that's the economy, and still 60% of the uh, stock market capitalization. Yeah, America's always had the most dominant, best yes. performing stock market in the world right. over a very long term, right? If you look at the last 100 years or so, right. America has been top of the uh, charts. It really has a true capitalist system that way. But what's happened in the last decade is extraordinary, uh, which is that the American stock market has done so well, has outperformed all of the global stock markets by such a massive amount that we have the situation today where even though America is only 25% of the global economy, and that share yeah. has remained stable for a while now, America's share of global stock market values is 60%, and that's never happened before. That number has been... Never closer, happened before. Yeah, that number has wow. been closer to 40 45% because America's had the uh, most dominant stock market in the world always. But uh, at 60%, that number is way out of whack, and I think that number is also bound to correct in the next few years. So, Richard, the other point that you make, which is fascinating, is that uh, America, it's like a seesaw. When America is down, the rest of the world is up and vice versa. Uh, America goes up and, and down. After each big decade, America has a downward decade. If it goes upward one decade, it goes downward the next compared to the rest of the world. For example, look at this graphic. America versus the rest of the world. It was going 10.1% higher than the rest of the world. 
and then next decade minus 3.3 so it's lower than the rest of the world then up 7.6 so what do you make from that now you're saying it's going to go down yeah as I said that if you look at the 100 year history the American stock market has been the best performing large market in the world by a long shot but it follows this pattern that after it does very well for one decade, especially in the recent four or five decades we have seen, right. in the subsequent decade, the American stock market tends to underperform yeah. the rest of the world because it becomes too expensive, right. expectations become too high. Right. So after this very extraordinary decade that America has had of great performance, I think that it is set now for underperforming in the Compared coming to decade, the rest of the world. also because its size has become disproportionate. So that will allow other countries including emerging markets such as India to do much better than America in the coming decade. That's my forecast and I think right. in 2023 we are likely to see shades of that play itself out. And already funds are moving out of America because they think it's reaching a peak compared to the rest of the world and other uh, stock markets may improve. Just about. In the last few weeks and months we're seeing some signs of some that. Some signs of that. But, but that's this going is a to very long-term process. It takes a while because most right. people are still anchored to the past. They still yeah, look at yeah. past returns yeah. and feel, oh, why should I go anywhere else when America's done so well? Right. But the point here is that these follow these decadal rhythms and that we are likely to shift uh, in 2023 onwards towards the rest of the world doing much better than America. Very interesting. And the other point you make in your next forecast is that tech stocks are going to shrink. And if you look at that, that's what's happened uh, after decades in which big tech firms dominate, they shrink in the next decade. That's historically, if you, these are top 10 firms by market capitalization. If you're in the top 10 in one decade, there's a high probability you will not be in the top 10 in the next decade. Just 10 years and it can transform everything. Yeah, so I think that this is very telling that this is uh, by market value, the top 10 firms in the world at the beginning of every decade. And as you can see, that eight or nine of them change. Amazing, uh, amazing. And when we had the last tech boom, which ended in 2000, the top tech firms in the world then were very different from what you have today. Those days you had Cisco, Intel, IBM. Right. The only survivor in, in a way has been Microsoft. Microsoft, uh, amazing record actually, yeah, yes. Exactly, but the top tech firms in the, in the world today are very different than what they were back then. And as you can see that in the last two or three years, there's already a lot of churn which is taking place. The Chinese tech firms have fallen off. Right. They're no longer in the top 10. Even in America, a firm like Meta, which is you know, Facebook's parent, yeah. that used to be in the top 10, now it's not even in the top 25. So this churn has begun. And I have, I've been telling people that I would not allocate any money or capital to these tech firms because that's the nature of the game, that once you become so big, so dominant, uh, your business models get spent, more competition comes in, regulatory uh, uh, pressure increases, right. and so that sows the seeds for new firms to emerge. And in general, I feel that tech space became very overvalued and overheated, uh, and that's going to cool down, and we're seeing those, that effect even in India now, where a lot of the yes. uh, tech craze that you had for some of the unicorns and other companies, right. that's cooling off. That's your next graphic, actually, um, that the tech slowdown will hit India as well. In fact, it already has hit it. In 2021, 35% of all capital raised through IPOs were tech. 2022, that became 2%, and that you think that pattern is going to continue. Yeah, uh, I think that you know, this was a climax we had in 2021. So in a, many ways, for, for people who have lived through this, there are shades of this or what happened in 2001 or so. Right. Which you got a big tech boom, boom yeah. and then you had a bit of a bust. And even though technology is here to stay, to be there for a long period of time, but it will take a while now for this recovery to happen, for people to digest uh, this mini bust that's happening. Now, it'll be much more pronounced in the U.S., but even in India, we're yeah. likely to see some of that happen, and the evidence is already in, yeah. in terms of what's going on. And I did want to censor this next forecast of yours, because you're saying more money for TV doesn't mean better TV. Less money means better TV. Just have a look at this data, and don't take this seriously. TV needs money. In fact... Less money has meant better TV. Money spent on TV content has surged from 2018 to in four years from 89 billion to 142 billion, but the content has not done well. Just look at his uh, data on content. Look at that. This is ratings of content and shows. It's just a downward slide and more money being spent and is going downward. So less money means, could mean better and that's what's happening. 
Um, I think that's what could happen. But the basic point is this, that this has been the golden age of television, as you know, especially for streaming, that right. we saw a surge in the number of new streaming services. We saw so much uh, cheap money available to fund uh, right. new projects, new series. So global content spend on television surged over the last few years. But my point is that uh, quality went down, that, you, that, you, that so many shows were commissioned which were well, possibly poorly conceived with right. a script or the concept was it properly done. But right. just in a hurry to get new subscribers, new users, we got so much of content out there. So the quality went down, the focus was on quantity. And now what's happened is that as you get much tighter money in general, as we have argued, because right. of higher interest rates. They will sort of raise also, their bar. And the also market, the yeah. tech sector has gone bust in which, you know, which is the funder for right. a lot of this stuff. Yeah. I think what happens now is that the focus on quality goes up because a lot f uh, uh, less number of series get commissioned, a lot number of shows get commissioned. And I think that this has, uh, as always, implications for India, which we're already seeing. Uh, yes. That in India, if you look at it, what happened is that because uh, all these major streaming services, the Netflix, Amazons, and right. Disney, they had so much money uh, to spend, yes. they spent uh, on buying all sorts of movies and all sorts of series. And a lot of that was junk, was drivel uh, in, uh, in yeah. terms of that. But they sustained that by doing that. Now they're cutting back dramatically. Even in India and in the world. Yeah, like I'm in told fact, that some of the yeah. leading services in India, right. if they were buying, let's say in a year, 30 or you know, 25 to 30 movies directly to go to digital, they, in, in 2023, that number is going to likely to be in single digits, maybe six or seven they will do. So uh, From 25 to six or seven. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, I, as just That's an example, yeah, yeah, in terms of that. So that means the pressure on budgets, the stars, how much they can charge in fact, is going to go down a lot. In fact, your graphic shows that's a global phenomenon as well because they made massive losses. And after those losses, there have been major cutback on series being commissioned. Just look at the losses that were made uh, by these streaming companies. Five billion dollar losses. What the reaction was, a cutback on the number of new shows from 200 to 150 between the 2021 and 2022, and you see that trend continuing. Yeah, that's uh, for the US, we have this data yes. that we will see the same effect out here. And I think that it may be for the better that you could focus on quality because today, you know, when we were having these uh, year end dinners and you go around the table and you ask people, what were your favorite series of yeah, the year? Yeah. You know, people would struggle to come up with names. There's right. so much content out there. Yeah. But when you try and come up with what were your favorite what series, what were your favorite movies, yeah. very few roll off your tongue. Uh, yes. So I think that it's because there's so much content, but so much of it was just not that well conceived that now we're likely to have much stricter budgets and possibly better quality going forward. So you're saying less money for television. Okay. We'll, we'll edit that out in the last uh, section when we show this, put this on air. Okay, and the next point you make is that after decades of being a big worry in the world, Japan, with high debt and all that, Japan is back. That's excellent news. And uh, you said earlier Japan had a major problem of debt. Uh, Japan, and now you're saying Japan's debt is now better than other developed countries. For example, in the early 1990s, look at that. Japan's debt was many times higher as a percentage of GDP than developed markets debt. Now, developed markets debt is higher than Japan. I think this is a transformation um, that is, is really welcome because Japan really did suffer for many years. For many decades. Many uh, decades. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, because I've, uh, like you will recall that in the late 1980s, uh, Japan was the shining star. Uh, right. It was, uh, in fact... 16% of the global economy. It was 45% of global stock market value. That was Japan. It was, and then because of the bust that happened and the way it was handled, but also driven by its poor demographics with the population shrinking, with debt levels so high and other issues, the Japanese economy and the Japanese market have done very poorly over the last uh, three decades. My point is that now quietly Japan may be making yeah. a come back because a lot of the problems that Japan has, the rest of the world also has in terms of the de debt levels have gone up, the demographics in the rest of the world. Um, we're seeing more than 60 countries today have their working age population that is shrinking. That number when Japan first went bust in 1990 was 
daily 20 countries had a shrinking working age population. So the rest of the world is a way converging with Can Japanese standards. With Japan and Japan uh, is going ahead. It's and just, Japan yeah. is improving. Its corporate profitability is improving over yes, time. Yes, that's your seen. next graphic. Have a look at that. Explain that to us. That profits are at, uh, at a historic peak in Japan now. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a 2% profit margin, they've gone up, what, three times. That's yeah. huge. And around the world, we have seen an increase in, co in corporate profit margins. But for a country that was criticized for not right. being that focused on profitability, I think it's interesting that in Japan, too, we are seeing this focus come through. And also some other you know, points that we discussed. For example, the female participation in the labor force is very high in Japan and you know, uh, at about 85 uh, percent. And you need more of that to try and offset the demographic disadvantage that Japan has and other countries to have. So it's a quiet comeback. It's not something which is headlined out there. But I suspect this year in 2023, we are likely to see Japan do relatively well because of the fact that on the downside, the rest of the world has converged with it. Right. On the upside, Japan has seen some major improvements from its corporate uh, profitability to the female participation in the labor force. That should help Japan in general. I'm going to go on complete diversion. Female participation gone up in Japan. And there's a lot of data that shows that India female participation is very low. But that goes against reality when you see it. You see a man sitting just doing nothing and... His, the women in his family are picking wood, burning, getting uh, uh, water from the well, cooking. I mean, they are participating. They are working much harder than men. They just don't get paid for it in India. So the data doesn't show their participation. That's not fair. That's possible. <laughs> Start paying for them. <laughs> okay. And uh, one interesting point that you raised that with Japan coming back, a rising Japan could lift India. The foreign investment from Japan to India could go up from 3% to 7% and higher. That's the trend. Yeah, so Japan's been a major investment partner of India. Having a healthier Japan with better corporate balance sheets could further that process. And even uh, Indo-Japanese trade has slowed down a lot in terms of that if you look at the exports that uh, the, uh, India does to Japan, uh, Japan's become a less and less significant partner on that. But the Japanese economy does better that could help our, our exports too at the margin. But the most important point being that as an investment partner, Japan's been quite significant. And, and it's if, and going better and better. And the better Japan does, the more India could benefit. That's right. Wow, that's huge. That's, that's very good news for India. Your next point is about people are outsourcing no longer to China, outsourcing outside China. And uh, that could be a big opportunity for countries in Asia, etc. If you look at outsourcing to China from America. China loses share of U.S. imports. It's gone down by about 4%. And the rest of Asia has gained. Uh, India has only made a small gain. So China, uh, outsourcing to China has gone down 4%. Other countries, excluding China in Asia, have gone up 4%. India so far, the outsourcing has only gone up 0.2%. Why is that? Why are we not getting more of that? Well, first to put this in perspective, what's going on, yeah. which is that um, China was the factory of the world for much of the last two or three decades, where everybody in, the, in America or Europe wanted to set up a factory in yes. China, yes. given the scale they have, yes. the low wages uh, uh, they've had. The last few years, a couple of things have happened. One, the Chinese wages have shot up a lot, making it a bit more uncompetitive. Right. And two, for geopolitical reasons, yeah. I think that people don't want to put all their eggs in the Chinese basket. They right. want to diversify out yeah. there. Yeah. And so they're looking for new investment destinations. But very interestingly, they still want to outsource because the wages are still so much cheaper in the rest of the world. Right, uh, right. That, you, that is reality. Yeah, yes. because in America, in the manufacturing sector, for example, wages, I think, for manufacturing employees are over $5,000 a month. But look at the wages that you have in the rest of Asia. It's uh, not even $500 uh, a month. So there's a lot of incentive to still outsource, just that people don't want to do that to China, China anymore. China, because of geopolitical, geopolitical all their wages reasons, going up. Yeah. Wages going up. And so, which are the places that they're looking for? It's been Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh, and even India's wages are very competitive, and we've yeah. seen some gain. Your but data just not on as that, much. actually, if you could take us through this, because China's wages are now much higher than the rest of Asia, and you can see there's a basically as China's economy has developed, the rest of Asia has a wage advantage over China. 
I mean, in other words, wage advantage means we have lower wages than China, and that's attractive for foreign investment. And you can see India's, you know, way below China in terms of wages, so it's attractive. But Vietnam and Bangladesh, very attractive in terms of foreign investors. But even with this, only 0.2 percent of that change is coming to India. Yeah. So both is looking at it. One is yeah. that it should be a lot higher, but two, the fact that. There is this opportunity out there that people still want to outsource. That's the message, just not to China. And India has the scale if it can attract some of that. So the solution to this is that India must try and get that outsourcing that's moving out of China and going to other. We must work harder at that. I mean, when I first started the world this week, I mean, the China change in wages. When I was there before you were born, people were going around in bicycles. With Mao outfits, thousands and thousands of bicycles on their main streets. I went into factories; they were Soviet type, old-fashioned, with poor everybody poor. Then came the first McDonald's. Then came the first golf uh, course, yes. and now there are two thousand McDonald's. <laughs> Deng Xiaoping. I don't care whether a cat is a black or white, as long as it catches mice. Right. So we need to learn. How to make things attract, and they made things very attractive for That's foreign right. investment, right? That's right. How can we do that? What's the solution? How do we make ourselves more attractive for foreign investment? Well, it's multifaceted. You know, like it's about the infrastructure you provide. It's about, uh, right? Yeah, you, know, you know, the harassment uh, uh, you have or don't have from, from the tax authorities, other people of people doing business in India. So I think that it's a. It's the entire ecosystem. It's not one factor which facilitates right. more foreign investment. But this is a solution we really need to improve jobs and improve growth, right? Yes, absolutely. To get this outsourcing that's going away from China, at the moment they come, look at India, and then go to Vietnam. <laughs> so there's something we need to change. We that's need a solution right. on that. Your next point is that there's going to be a return to orthodoxy, and what do you mean by that? Just look at this: ten developing countries with biggest twin deficits. You mean? Fiscal plus external uh, account deficit, and India is in the top ten of the world in terms of. So this is a worry, and now orthodoxy means change that. Yeah, no. In terms of uh, the point I'm making here is this, which is that because the era of easy money is over, interest rates have gone higher everywhere, and financing in general has become much more right. difficult in this environment. The scope for policymakers to do something too experimental, something away from what is defined as economic orthodoxy, which is that you need to follow a tight fiscal policy, you need to have uh, relatively high interest rates. If you try to do something different, the market's going to come and punish you. And we saw that right. in the last uh, year or so. Uh, exhibit A being UK, where Liz Truss tried to right. do something too different yeah. in terms of cutting taxes and still not cutting spending and thinking she can blow the fiscal deficit out. Uh, the markets revolted, and she in fact lost her job. So the world now looks very closely at deficits, your twin deficit. Yeah. Yeah. So the focus has come back. When money yeah. was easy yeah, and there was too much yeah. plenty around, you could finance a lot of bad economics and bad behavior. Unorthodox. Unorthodox yes. uh, stuff, was like, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Now the scope is very limited. The Very good news for India is the fact that we have generally followed an orthodox economic script. That even though we yes. have large deficits, uh, we are not blowing them out. And one of the things which yeah. I did sort of uh, commend even the current uh, folks for was the fact that uh, we did not overstimulate too much because there was so much pressure to, to overstimulate, uh, yeah, to stimulate yes. and and do that. And I think that you know that some countries which did it, including Brazil and others. Paid a price for it, yeah. uh, so I think it's very so important. Back to orthodoxy, and to some extent, India has been reasonably orthodox in its fiscal and uh, fiscal management. If you see, India has actually been unpunished so far, according to your data, due to fiscal orthodoxy. We've been careful. India's fiscal balance has improved a little bit, while the rest of the world, in terms of emerging markets, has got much worse. Yes, this is what happened in the last year, which is the yes. fact that these forecasts. Changed right. where India saw some improvement. So for now, even as uh, I think that you know that they present the budget, right. I think that the focus should be on orthodoxy mm -hmm. and not any experimentation because the temptation will be with an election coming up in 2024. 
let's spend more, let's do more right, like socks right. and stimulus. In the run up to elections. Yeah, and you do not want the market to revolt <laughs> against that because that will be a real problem. Very, very true. Um, what are they called? Ravedies or what are they called? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, this again is a section I would like to censor. You're saying you're going to have a relief from elections. We love elections. Why do you want a relief from it? What do you mean by this? Let's have a look at what your data says. Uh, 2023 unusually will be a light year for elections around the world. Uh, then that's just before the election storm in 2024. Uh, 2023, no country has elections this year. And uh, this has not happened this century. Among the G7 countries. Among, uh, among the, the advanced, yeah, yeah. yeah. Among the, the advanced ones that have a huge the seven impact. Largest, uh, yeah. uh, democracies, yeah. there's not a single country having elections in 2023 and My that's God. not ever happened this century so it's quite a coincidence yeah, that that's happened and you're saying on g20 uh, the lowest number only two elections this year lowest number in 30 35 years yes My that's God. right and that you're saying but there are two elections and spotlight will be on possible regime change in turkey and nigeria are you uh, is based on opinion polls you don't have forecast <laughs> No, no, I but that's what people is, are talking about. Yeah, that's what people are talking about, which yeah. is the fact that among the G20 economies also, which includes some emerging markets, there are hardly any elections this year. So very rarely does something be newsworthy for something not happening. And the fact that we have a uh, bit of a pause in 2023 is very unusual as far as the global electoral cycle goes. But a couple of countries which are having elections... Uh, yeah not that big but still significant are yeah. Turkey and Nigeria yeah, they are and in both those places if I can dare say so <laughs> it, that if you get a regime change that could like end up being good for those countries because in Turkey's case we have seen that Erdogan you know who started off strong has really run his economy into the ground uh, now it's far from clear that he will lose but the opinion polls are pretty tight so we'll right. see how that plays itself right. out so right. that's an election worth keeping on Nigeria. And he's had one or two setbacks in local elections. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's like an election worth keeping on. And also because there's so much fear about strongmen rule and stuff. In 2022, anyway, was not a great year for strongmen around the world, arguably. Mm -hmm. But as far as Turkey is concerned, we, we, we'll see what happens in 2023. Yeah. And Nigeria is the other one. I just want to your forecast for your travel in 2023. It's not going to be after these statements, not going to be Turkey or Nigeria, is it? It's always <laughs> India for election travel. <laughs> okay. No, no. I mean, just for travel after you've said... Uh, well, the truth. Yes. Okay. And, uh, but elections, are, this is an amazing factor that you found. Elections cause gains in stock markets in developing economies, but in developed economies, stock markets underperform in election years. Look at um, stock markets during election years. Developed countries down by 3% underperforming relative to other stock markets. Developing countries... They overperform by 4%. Elections are good for developing countries, stock markets and the economy. We should have lots more elections. <laughs> no, this is the piece of research that I had done earlier and we've spoken extensively about, which is that normally in emerging markets, the best stock market returns tend to be when a new leader comes to power with a fresh mandate because that's typically when the new leader is most incentivized to carry out economic reforms. Right. right. Uh, so that's what so we've seen hope, historically. So hope. there's hope. Yeah. Uh, and so therefore when, like in developed countries, the uh, potential for a leader to come and change things is much more limited. So it leads to more volatility, but not necessarily a, a better outcome. But in emerging markets, fresh leadership can often lead to better stock market performance and that's something which we may even see in the likes of Turkey, Nigeria, there's a regime change. I think the stock markets there could fly uh, in 2023. Now you're saying we should look out for bluebirds when there's gloom and doom. When the things are going well, people look for black swans. We've known about that. But now bluebirds we, want, uh, we should look out for. And the gloom that's being forecast that you, you highlight here is that not since surveys began have forecasters thought that a recession is going to come more likely than it is now. The probability of a recession is the highest it's been for 50 years. That forecasters are now, of course, economists are invariably wrong, especially Bengali forecasters, but we do forecast at least and we are wrong. Uh, but now a large, almost 50, over 40% are saying there will be a recession. Yeah, so the context here is this. One, as you point out, that in the history of surveys, economists have never forecast a recession. 
So if a recession does happen in 2023, it'll be the first time in history of surveys that economists actually called a recession. But the broader point here is this, that generally there's a lot of gloom around the world. Right. Uh, and it's partly because of economics, it's partly because of politics, because we've right. been through such a difficult period yes. where you had the pandemic and then you had the invasion of Ukraine. You've had these kind of, and then politics in many countries has not been that favorable right. with all sorts of uh, surprise uh, election results. And now black swans in general came to, uh, rightly or wrongly, came to be a symbol for uh, what could go wrong. You know, when everything is going when well, everything you is say, going be well. careful about this or that. But yeah. when everything is going terribly, yeah. you look for bluebirds. Yeah, so I love that. Yeah, so this yeah. is something which I found that uh, the bluebird is in fact a symbol of joy. Uh, mm, it's, yeah. uh, it's something which bring, brings an unexpected happiness. And so therefore, it's a symbol of even hope that in the direst of times, you should uh, keep some hope that a bluebird may arrive. So right. my point is that even uh, that this is a tough era. Money has become much more difficult. Interest inflation. rates are higher. There's right. a lot of forecast about what's going to happen. Down in the growth, uh, inflation. Growth and yeah. also we're conditioned by all these shocks for happening in Russia, yeah. the pandemic. In fact, actually, you, you've got a little list which is lovely. At times of gloom, it may be best to look for bluebirds rather than black swans. Uh, so it's bye-bye black swans? No. One second. Black swans are what we've just been through. War in Ukraine, the terrible pandemic and Brexit. Right. Which had a huge impact on Europe and yeah. therefore on the rest of the world. And we're looking for bluebirds now, which you think maybe Ukraine peace settlement, US-China reconciliation maybe, and maybe inflation disappears. But at least look for them in this period of gloom. Yeah, because all these are very hard to predict and are not the base case forecasts. But my point is that in times of gloom, maybe something comes and suddenly brings us joy. So therefore, the focus shifts to looking for bluebirds. Ruchir, with 97% last year, now this year, you've got to get 99%, oh, 100%. Can you quickly run through your forecast for the top trends of 2023? Right. So I think that the first one we spoke about with the long grind, that right. in the past we had V-shaped recoveries. Now we are likely to see a pattern which is more like a saucer shape or a smile in terms of that it takes a while for a downturn to right. set in, but it takes a while for that to exit. Right. The second one is a peak dollar, that the dollar has had an amazing run over the last decade, but it is overdue now for a correction, like has been the pattern for the last 50, 60 years when it has such a strong performance. And the fact that places like New York are the most expensive cities in the world tell you that the dollar is quite overvalued. Right, right. Uh, related to that is the fact that America also had a great decade, but now possibly beginning 2023 is bound to underperform the rest of the world because it is so overvalued and has a disproportionate share of the global stock market value. And it's like a seesaw. When they underperform, the rest of the world overperform. It's so large that, yeah. you know, we talk about the world, at least in yeah, investment yeah. terms, as uh, America and then the rest of the world. The fourth is about technology, which is that, again, we are just coming off a big tech boom. Too much money got thrown at too many bad ideas, even in the tech boom, or it was a good idea gone too far funneled right. by too much easy money. Right. I think that that's also coming to an end. And a lot of the big tech firms that did so well in that tech boom are likely to underperform in uh, 2023. Right. Uh, the fifth trend we spoke about was the same tech boom also lifted uh, a, a lot of media companies. Uh, so much money was available for launching new streaming platforms. And that should new carry content. on. Uh, you're being censored here. <laughs> okay. But, I but think you're saying less money could mean better TV because quality uh, checks will be much better. Yeah. And I think that that could be the tr uh, true in India as well. That we'll maybe remember more of what we are seeing and right. uh, as we get more selective about uh, content. Right. The next trend I speak about is that Japan, that, the, that nobody really cares about Japan. Even our sort of intellectual uh, knowledge of Japan has been atrophied by the fact that uh, it's been on the sidelines for such a long period high of time. High debt, yes. High debt, bad demographics. But right. my point is that quietly, maybe just Japan may be beginning a comeback. comeback. Very yeah. interesting. That. And even related to that is the seventh trend that, in fact, China, the labor costs Sorry, have gone up so much. just one thing that you mentioned with Japan coming back that could help India, investment in India a lot. Yes, because uh, Japan is a very key investment partner uh, yeah. of India. Yeah. And if that does better, it helps India. Right. The seventh trend we spoke about was on China, uh, which is that uh, 
people are still looking to outsource in countries such as America because the wages are so much higher, uh, but they don't want to do it to China anymore uh, because of geopolitical reasons and wages in China have gone up significantly. So therefore, the outsourcing shifts possibly to places uh, including India, but we need to seize that opportunity because so far it's solution, the Vietnams of the world which have been the disproportionate beneficiaries of the outsourcing. The solution for that China. is India must be able to attract this investment better That's because right. it's hardly attracting it now. It's yeah. going to Vietnam and other countries. Sorry. Yeah. The uh, eighth trend we spoke about is the return of orthodoxy. Uh, a common thread which runs through these trends is really the fact that you have the return of uh, higher interest rates now. And, the, and so it means that you've got to be much more careful in this environment. Don't be wild, be yeah. conservative. Yeah. That's right. Don't and do India's anything that, unorthodox actually. and India has done that so far. So, uh, but and we hope that it's continued in the budget and other policy announcements because the risk yeah. is al always before an election year that if you decide to do too much. But you do not want to do that kind of experimentation with other countries that have suffered doing that. So, so far so good as far as India is concerned. The ninth trend is about elections, uh, that uh, around the world it's quite an extraordinary coincidence that we just don't have too many elections this year taking place, national elections at least. Right. Uh, and so the focus may be on some of the smaller elections, relatively smaller elections in Turkey, Nigeria, but generally it's quite extraordinary to no have way. a year like this where you virtually have no big election around the world. How will we manage without elections? But you did say that in developing countries, elections means a boost to the economy and the stock market. Especially if the leader changes. So and that's not a what relief. We miss elections. That's what could happen in Nigeria, Turkey. <laughs> yes. And the last one to sum it up is that we are in a pretty gloomy environment given the forecast that most people have and given how we're conditioned to negative shocks. And so in this environment, look out for what could be the positive surprises symbolized by bluebirds that could come uh, and we try to guess that but the very nature of surprises is impossible to forecast uh, yeah. so i think that's where that's, we are that's today. the definition of a surprise well you have certainly made some major forecasts and it really will affect all of our viewers and our behavior over the next year and sometimes we do a mid-year one uh, but we will certainly do this again next year and 99 percent on nothing Done? Well, that's <laughs> only a time high will bar. Tell. Um, I'm not sure how to react to that, but... <laughs> only time will tell you. Exactly, episode, yeah. Which is the worst cliche in the world. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much. I once again learned a hell of a lot out of that. Uh, did I say that? I think that was misquoted. Uh, I, but no, I did learn a lot. Thank you very much. I think everybody did. And we'll be following the economy with much more foundational knowledge based on all your data. Thank you very much. All of this is available in detail on NDTV.com. And Ruchir is also writing part of this for the Financial Times. So watch for this and watch for the new organization called Breakout Capital. I know you told me don't mention it, but I have to. Thanks very much. See you again. Bye-bye.